So I would like to say, um, when we did this lecture, uh, the first Truth or Consequences lecture at the end of January, it really became the start of something very big. At the end of that discussion, I made the point that democracy is a process. And the reason these lectures began, or the concept of these lectures began, was because people started recognizing more and more the problems confronting Armenia. Um, the point I made then is democracy is a process, but it's always evolving. But any democracy anywhere in the world needs an engaged people. And in the case of Armenia, we need an engaged diaspora because as you'll see from the Policy Forum Armenia speech uh, paper that we're going to use as the foundation for tonight's discussion, the diaspora is very much a part of the Armenian nation. So looking back at that January event, the following happened. We provide a lot of information. I know many of you were here. Um, so you remember we provide a lot of information. It was demonstrated that there is a huge level of interest in the issues that were discussed. And that discussion reflected a desire that there were the, of many to be engaged. Each of us has a different level of engagement that we're seeking, but there is that desire to be engaged. The impetus behind truth or consequences, um, and your interest and demand has in fact created a series of these lectures, was an injustice that was perpetrated on an American citizen who was doing business in Armenia. What continues is a seemingly dysfunctioning justice system in the case of Nadek Hartunian. And you will see a video after the speakers, before the question and answer, a brief video about Nadek's case. Another key point from the lecture that we heard in January was Professor Simon Payaslian said the following, an engaged diaspora actually helps those in Armenia. He also made the point that if it takes 20 years to ad address the issues and the problems that we raise, that's fine. But it can't take 20 years to start the process. So hence these discussions. 70 years of Soviet rule succeeded in doing two things. First, Armenia and the diaspora were effectively divorced from one another. Contacts were limited and perceptions of a national reality mostly unrelated, with the two halves developing separately from each other. Distinct identities, distinct realities, and distinct concepts of what is and what is not Armenia or Armenian. Second, the separation succeeded in idealizing the idea of Armenia, not just the state, but the concept of a nation with a state. This almost celestial place that existed in the hearts and minds of diasporans everywhere, and Armenia wholly and completely detached from the Soviet Republic of Armenia. But all this was about to change. Almost overnight, the distant myth of independence was unfolding before the eyes of the diaspora. Some traditional diaspora political parties and organizations, groups which had for some 70 years carried on the fight for statehood, for resurrection from destruction and devastation, groups which had upheld Armenian identity throughout the world for decades, were now being broadsided by an independence movement at the hands of a seemingly ragtag team of unknowns in Soviet Armenia. The psyche of the diaspora was in shock. The communique of October 1st, 1988, memorialized this shock to some extent. One-time visionaries of an independent Armenia, the carriers of the nation's hopes and dreams, were now singing a different tune. They called for caution, urging their brethren in Armenia and Artsakh, and this is a direct quote, to forego extreme acts and some radical calls and expressions that could unsettle the good standing of our nation in its relation with the higher Soviet bodies. The reaction from Armenia was equally emotional. Discounting the reasons for the disconnect and shock experienced by the diaspora, cries of betrayal were quick to be heard. The equation, however, was not so simple and did not stop there. The devastating December 1988 earthquake, the, state of hostilities in, the start of hostilities in Artsakh, and a new wave of exodus swelling the ranks of Armenian communities in Europe and North America made things that much more complicated. Then 2008 rolled around. It quickly became evident that despite the uptick in interaction, improved availability of information, and the benefit of three Armenia diaspora conferences, in some 20 years, things hadn't really changed all that much in terms of Armenia diaspora relations. The presidential election of February 2008, in effect, removed the band-aid from the gash. Unlike 1988, the events on and after February 19, 2008, were well known to the diaspora thanks to social media, and the availability of the internet. 
Not only did the largely fraudulent presidential election spark massive protests in Armenia, but tens of thousands of people supported the Yerevan demonstrations in cities outside of Armenia. Nonetheless, only a handful of diasporan sources were providing unbiased information about the events unfolding in Yerevan. As a repeat of the letdown in 1988, the traditional diaspora organizations adopted a vastly different response to the developments than the dissent shown in Armenia. In effect, the March 18, 2008 joint statement uh, by the leading Armenian organizations in the United States offered tacit support for the authorities. The statement failed to address violations of basic democratic principles and fundamental human rights and effectively neglected those who were subjected to these egregious violations. While some diaspora-based group, based groups did voice concerns, the leading diaspora organizations chose to become bystanders while Ar Armenian civil society was being stripped to its core. With strong efforts to suppress any disagreement with Armenian authorities in the diaspora, leading organizations acting in conjunction with the representatives of the state made sure statements made to the public were consistent with the position of Yerevan, placing the blame with the opposition for the largely state-sponsored events culminating in death and destruction. Of course, nation-state relations is a two-way street. Armenia shoulders its share of the burden here as well. Cordial and considerate in rhetoric, official Yerevan has at times discounted the diaspora component in the formation and implementation of its foreign <coughs> policy. Furthermore, whatever the reasons may be, the fact remains that, in the dia that the diaspora continues to demonstrate a rather poor understanding of the realities on the ground in Armenia. As pointed out earlier, traditional diaspora organizations persist in remaining apathetic to human rights violations faced by Armenian citizens. Of course, this complacency has the tendency of encouraging the authorities in continued abu abuses on the ground since their brethren abroad are not willing to produce a credible warning as to the limits of what will and will not be tolerated in terms of human rights abuses and economic mismanagement. As for the Armenian state, while benefiting from diaspora lobbying efforts, Yerevan has not been very responsive to the diaspora's needs and requests and prefers to deal with prominent individuals as opposed to organizations. But enough with what's wrong. Let's focus on what can be done and how this process can be set in motion today. First things first, principally, we must refuse to support the corrupt. To date, the diaspora has not done the necessary prodding on this issue. In fact, as we saw in 2008, the diaspora has effectively encouraged the status quo. It can no longer afford to allow Yerevan's human rights abuses and trampling of principles of democracy to continue to go unnoticed and unaddressed. Second, the diaspora must form a vision for Armenia. This vision must largely be compatible with the aspirations of the citizenry of Armenia. Third, we must overcome our traditional fragmentation and must set in place mechanisms for mobilizing resources and monitoring activity on the ground in Armenia. This leads to my next point. We can be more diligent in policing the relationships of our leaders with Armenia's leadership and demand accountability where and when appropriate. In fact, we can even be more diligent in policing official Yerevan. This very event here tonight is an act of such policing. Your friend, your brother, your son, Nari Karukunyan, was subject to the abuses I've touched upon tonight. And by gathering here, you're sending a loud message to Yerevan that you're not going to stand for it. We must realize that the apolitical approach we tend to practice encourages the authorities in their continued abuses. If you don't believe me, just wait for the results of the upcoming parliamentary elections. In a country of arguably less than 3 million people, the Central Election Commission just a few weeks back announced that there are 2,485,000 eligible voters. How is this possible? I don't know. But then again, I'm sure neither do the authorities back home. Simply put, we all need to act. Whether you agree with the criticisms and suggestions offered in this report or not, you'll be hard-pressed to argue that in the preceding 20 years, we've maximized the inherent potential of both the diaspora and the Republic of Armenia as a nation. We have not. Because we have not, we risk jeopardizing both. We risk jeopardizing the welfare, if not outright existence, of the nation as a whole. We need not stand so close to this brink. 
We can move away from it if we want to. We should. Our ancestors would have tolerated nothing less. Our descendants deserve just as much, if not more. Thank you.